Thanks, Francisco, for the nice introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. So it's good to contribute with Incline and really nice to see some familiar faces around. So I'm going to start sharing my screen already. And then we can talk. So just go play here. So yeah, just a quick uh, disclaimer here. Uh, I'm now in the Navy. I have recently joined the Navy. I just set up my stopwatch because sometimes I just go crazy in presentations. And as Francisco said, I'm serving now as a Lieutenant Commander here at uh, Admiral Paul Moreira uh, Institute for Marine Studies. Uh, at Ohio do Cabo, which I think I suggest uh, all of you to know if you can, great place, kind of paradise. And, but this study was conducted prior to my, uh, for me joining the Navy. So uh, I was still at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, which I'm linked to, uh, I'm still linked to, so we still contribute together, so it's really nice. And so I was invited to talk about this, this actually this study that came out last May, right? When we proposed to do something kind of crazy, kind of new, and I'm going to do this presentation really in a formal way. And we can talk at the end, maybe questions, but, and well, I'd like to give you a background. So it's kind of where you're coming from and why we decided to do that before you, you talk about how we decided to do that. Uh, I believe you're all uh, familiar with uh, IPCC models uh, and the coupled model into comparison project, uh, the CIMIP, right now in six phase, so CIMIP six. So these are amazing tools for uh, climate, uh, climate investigations, no doubts there. You can just look at a uh, recent Nobel Prize, right? And they, just provide amazing information about climate, uh, climate projections, and they, I mean, this, uh, this data is supposed to help a decision making. It, it's going to help decision making, not that the best decisions are being made right now. But anyway, back to uh, CMIP6 models. Although they are amazing, they still have this caveat of this problem they cannot fully represent life. And this, this study was conducted by this interdisciplinary team. So we have my lab, lab which is the climate, uh, physical oceanography, climate and cryosphere lab at the University of Sao Paulo. And we have to, and we had this uh, microbial ecology lab and microbial oceanography lab uh, from the University of Sao Paulo, and we are together. And it's, you know, can you come up with something that some, some way think of some way to to look at the impact of climate change uh, on microbial communities? Uh, but the problem is, these models just can represent these microbial communities. So what can we do? So we go. So yeah, the the the, the goal was uh, of this study uh, was to try to come up with something to, to, to think of this potential impacts of sea surface warming on this uh, microbial communities. Uh, we were talking about the Western Antarctic Peninsula. You're gonna see a map of that, of the stations <clears throat> pretty soon. And in the data, what we had was, we had this uh, SST, sea surface temperature outputs from 25 CMIP models, CMIP6 models or ESMs, right, or system models. And we had this in situ uh, microbial diversity indices uh, that I'm going to show you later. And so we first decided, uh, decided to compute the time of emergence, which means uh, it's, it refers to when this climate change signal escapes what we call the internal variability uh, envelope, right? So when you can actually see the anthropogenic uh, warming signal reaching uh, specifically uh, specific uh, spaces in the Southern Ocean. And again, we're just looking at the Southern Ocean. And then uh, machine learning jumps in because we didn't know uh, 
couldn't think of a way to, at first we couldn't think of a way to link these things together, these projections and microbial uh, diversity indices. So Amanda just suggested, let's use machine learning. I said, okay, let's do it. So how we do it? And she said, I don't know. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure, out, figure this out. And then we had Bruno, who has this really amazing uh, background in computer science. And he helped a lot to come up with something new. And just so you know, we used the random forest model. Right? We're gonna talk about this later a bit better. So this is the map for the stations. You see, it's just the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. We had uh, 105 stations there. So we had 105 samples to use, right? And just jumping into the results here, we have this time series for uh, this SST change, right? Just the SST change and the entire Southern Ocean. You're gonna see a map of that. And we have four scenarios for really, uh, Non uh, IPCC scenarios, which are SSP 126, 4, uh, 245, 370, and 585. As you can see, the more sustainable scenarios are in blue, and the higher emission scenarios are in kind of orange and reddish, I guess. Right? These are uh, annual means for the entire Southern Ocean and the Thin lines are just uh, individual runs and the thick lines are the kind of, let's call it ensemble models, right? Uh, or, or ensemble means, I'm sorry. So we have this change and it's pretty clear that uh, the higher emissions, we are supposed uh, to expect uh, higher changes, right? More intense changes in temperature or at least at sea surface temperatures in the Southern Ocean. And yeah, that's it. And then we just go for the toy. I, I like to call it toy because, you know, the time of emergence, because, you know, toll or, or tolls wouldn't sound really nice. So let's go for toys. And you can look at the upper left. It's uh, what you see here is a map of when the anthropogenic signal is supposed to hit the surface of the Southern Ocean, right? We have decades here. So everything that's in, uh, in gray here, let's see if my pointer is showing here. I just came, tried to get biggest pointer I could uh, find. And you see, we're just expecting to see, at least, at least in this part here, uh, some actual uh, anthropogenic uh, warming to hit Antarctica by the end of the century in this scenario, the sustainable scenario. And then just go across scenarios and look at uh, SSP 585, and it's pretty clear what's going on here. So uh, with a higher pressure, we're expected to have this really earlier toys hitting uh, Antarctica. The problem is we have this, everything you see in these uh, white areas here, except for the ice shelves. We have two big ice shelves here, but everything is you're seeing in white here. Uh, are zones that aren't expected to see any anthropogenic warming by the end of the century, right? In the sustainable scenario. If you look at the more, uh, the business as usual scenario, uh, we, are we can expect these uh, really important areas here to see this, uh, this, this warming uh, hitting them uh, right before, during the second half of the century. And maybe more important than that uh, are those green parts here uh, where we can expect this warming to hit the coast of Antarctica by mid-century. And that's really a worrying because we're actually not entirely sure of what that will cause, what would be the consequence of that. And we're trying to look at a tiny piece of that. So here we have just a zoom in uh, in, our, in our study region. And Pretty much, pretty much the same information, right? We see that uh, in the, 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 the sustainable scenarios, you can expect uh, this, this anthropogenic warming to hit uh, the surface by the end of the century. Uh, whereas uh, in the more uh, 
and higher emission scenarios, you can see this. And please pay, pay, pay attention to this part here, the, the white parts here. This is really important because as long as, as this warming signal stays away from the Weddell uh, Sea and the Ross Seas, uh, we can expect, we should expect uh, the, all the water masses formation processes to get along well. And this is a problem here, right? And you see this, it, this, it, this warming at the surface, uh, this may be a problem. And now I'm talking about climate uh, in a global scale here, because this could impact uh, the deep water formation. And that's a problem for all the Earth heat budget and things. But well, here it focuses on, on microbial community, communities, right? So as you can see, we just are supposed to expect a much uh, expect much earlier thoughts on uh, higher emission scenarios, right? And then we're supposed to link this information to uh, the microbial communities uh, and diversity uh, information, and that's where the machine learning uh, uh, came in place. Uh, so uh, this here to the left, we are seeing a map pretty similar to that first map, but this is uh, showing us a map of the Chow one uh, index, which is the richness uh, index for the microbial communities, right? Uh, we have a sequence of three or four years of uh, observations here. So it's pretty much a snapshot, right? And then we have the projections or predictions done with the random forest uh, machine learning models, right? Just so you know, we had uh, 105 samples. So for to train the machine, we have to use something around 80% of these uh, samples. And we do it, and we use the last 20% to test the, the model. And you do that many, many, many times until we get a quite good prediction of the model. So here I can give you something. We use something around a thousand uh, runs to train the, the, the machine. So it could get a reasonable response. And, and then you just use those uh, SSD projections from, SS, from CMIP6 to look at the potential effects. And now you, hand, you can see the maps uh, of the Chowan index predicted to the end of the century according to each scenario, right? And as you can see here, again, at SSP 126, uh, it changes just a little. It doesn't seem like too much, right? But when you look at, again, at the SSP 585, uh, it changes a lot. And this desert-like beige color wasn't, uh, was chosen purpose, actually, right? It's quite dramatic, but it's true. We can expect a lot of changes, right, in uh, this, uh, microbial diversity. And then we looked at another index, which is the Shannon index for diversity too. And this is more surprising because if you look at the observations and the predictions for the SSP uh, 126, we can see pretty to not, I mean, almost no change, right? Actually we have computed this, it's below 1% of change. So it's really close to nothing. The sustainable scenario is really nice. It kind of gives us the idea that we still have a chance, right? And again, the, the higher emission scenarios just uh, predict this really kind of catastrophic uh, scenario, right? This drop, this big loss of diversity in these communities here. And then when further, uh, we decided that we should, we could, I mean, try to look at these communities in terms of composition. Just a bit of water here. <clears throat> and so again, to the left, you can see the observations and each color represents uh, a different group within this, uh, community samples, right? Uh, we have here below, we have the temperature. So we see they, they tend to, we have different distributions uh, within different uh, temperature ranges, right? And then we use this uh, composition here and you use the model and you had to run the, uh, the random forest model again for 
thousand times and to, to, to look at what could happen to this composition uh, throughout the 20, uh, 21st century. And it's quite interesting because what this is showing us here is that, again, for the sustainable scenarios, we can expect a uh, little to none uh, change, right? Uh, is it, is it's like uh, things would just remain uh, the same, and just a point here, because uh, all the Southern Ocean, specifically, if you look particularly the, the Weddell Sea and the Ross Seas, Sea, they have this kind of ability to buffer the, 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 the warming signal, at least to a point, right? And it seems that this is what's happening here. If we're expected to see little uh, warming, some, there's some warming, but just a little warming, that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't be a problem, basically. But whereas if you look at those uh, higher emission scenarios, both of them, uh, we could expect, we can expect things to change, right? Uh, we should not be looking at ex specifically uh, what's gonna change in one particular year, but we see that uh, some groups tend to, to, to lower the, their participation, and some groups tend to, to, to become more important. And that may be a problem because uh, those groups are in the base of the food web, right? And they are important for things like criminalization and, and we don't know yet what could happen to the uh, higher levels of the, web, the, the food web. And that's something that we should, that's something we should be discussing. Uh, if you have any guesses, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, and this is something that we're planning to discuss further. And well, then just to sum up everything, uh, we've seen that this higher emission scenarios project earlier toys, right? It, it, it makes sense. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, these sustainable, uh, sustainable scenarios kind of uh, uh, gives us this idea that the Southern Ocean would keep his ability to, to keep this warming away from that uh, very particular community and that environment. And again, if we think that in these sustainable scenarios, uh, we can, could expect really close to known changes in this diversity indices, I wonder, do, do, would, would, would we just stay within this internal variability envelope? Uh, and that's a question, uh, that's my guess, but that's more for you to think about, right? And finally, we've seen that this SST changes uh, tend to impact different groups in different ways, right? But it's not all about SSD changes. We have other variables that we haven't looked at uh, yet. We tend to, like salinity and pH. And that's why I'm really interested in biogeochemical modeling, because I want to see what we could expect from this side of the story of the oceanography and climate system. So we can go further uh, in this kind of investigations. And I think that's it. I'd like to thank you all. You can easily find me on these emails. Thanks. And almost 20 minutes. I'm good in time. I tend to run. <laughs> <laughs>